Now, when a child reaches adolescence, their body will start changing in some dramatic ways. One of those ways is that they'll experience a sudden growth spurt. And in order to fuel that growth spurt, teenagers typically will need to dramatically increase their intake, their caloric intake. So this high growth in metabolism requires more calories. For girls, we would recommend an average of about 2,200 calories a day. And for boys, it's 2,700 calories a day. So we're just saying teenagers, they need to eat more. They need to eat obviously good foods, but they need to eat more foods to fuel this rapid growth. Now, some particular nutrients that we focus on for teenagers is extra iron to help produce hemoglobin for uh, muscle mass and replace lost blood. And for both sexes, their skeletons are expanding at an accelerated rate, so they need extra calcium to fuel that bone growth. Now, typically, most U.S. teens consume enough calories. In fact, they consume more than enough calories in most cases, but they're not getting a good diet. You know, most of those calories they're consuming are like empty calories, or they're just getting way too much fats. So, the this these poor eating habits, this these bad foods that teenagers tend to prefer for various reasons can lead to pretty serious consequences, such as obesity. One out of six teens in our country is overweight, according to their BMI, their body mass index. Now I know, now I know BMI is not the best way to assess the health of an individual. You know, people who have more muscles will just naturally have a higher BMI. But BMI is a good, easy to understand you know, simple index of how healthy a person might be. So it's like just the first step. After you determine a person's BMI, you'll have to take those additional steps to figure out exactly how healthy they are. So all it really is, is just a ratio of their height to weight. That's all. So you you record your weight, you record your height, and you compare it on a scale, and that will tell you whether you're in the normal range, whether you're underweight or overweight or obese. Now, typically overweight teens, they have some health issues, but they have other issues as well, like social problems and mental health issues, because something that comes along with being obese in our culture is a lot of ridicule and shame. So overweight teens do tend to be socially rejected. They're unpopular. They have a lower self-esteem, and they are just have a wide range of health problems, like they may have high blood pressure or even diabetes. Now, <clears throat> for some people, being obese is definitely a genetic issue. Genetics can affect uh, how likely you are to become obese through the basal met metabolic rate. You know, all I'm saying is some people are just going to be more easy, it's going to be easier for them to put the pounds on. <clears throat> but as I always say, genetics is not destiny. Just because you inherited these traits to be, you know, more likely to be overweight, that doesn't mean that's going to happen. The environment has to trigger those traits. You know, the, the media can put ideas into your head, your parents can put food in front of your face, and if 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 these images, if these foods that you're being presented with are unhealthy, then it's definitely going to trigger those obese traits. So all I'm really trying to say here is, regardless of what your genes are, you need to be mindful of what kinds of foods you're putting in front of your teenagers. You need to be mindful of what kinds of ideas they have about health and nutrition. And you want to try to long before they reach the teenage years, instill, instill some good eating habits in them. But if a teenager does become obese, there is some things we can do. There are successful interventions that focus on setting and monitoring goals. So 
like tracking how much junk food you eat, tracking how much exercise you get, especially cardiovascular exercise, and tracking how much sedentary behavior you engage in. So what these teens can do is just, you know, keep track of this stuff and try to alter over time how much they engage in these kinds of activities. And parents can help by setting realistic goals and using behavioral principles. Remember, as adults, we have a fully developed frontal lobe so that we can more rationally, we can more accurately predict what strategies will be successful and which ones will not. So we could just use that rational part of our brain to help explain to the teen what they should expect under what timeline and help them to stick to those goals by using those operant conditioning methods like reward and punishment. Uh, just in general, reward would work a lot better in a lot of these cases. You know, like if the child is eating right and getting enough exercise, maybe you could, you know, take them out to a movie or maybe you could go buy them some new clothes or whatever it is they might want to do. So you're just helping your child to more accurately monitor their own lifestyle. Now, there are weight loss programs out there. There's a whole you know, long list of various weight loss programs out there that your teenager could get involved in, but a lot of times these things don't work. You know, they're, they're just short-term problems. It's, it's, it's like trying to put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. You know, it's not going to fix the issue. It's only going to help temporarily. If you don't have a long-term strategy about how to deal with this problem, it's just going to come back. You know, the teen might lose some weight and then it just comes right back again when they quit the program. But you don't want to focus on this kind of stuff too strongly. You know, it's important for parents to be involved, but if they put too much pressure on their children, this could result in the child developing an eating disorder. So yeah, these typically develop as a result of excessive pressure to lose weight, especially for girls. And there's a few different kinds of eating disorders, but the two most common ones are anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. So anorexia refers to this persistent refusal to eat, accompanied by an irrational fear of being overweight. And I often say that anorexics have a lot of psychotic symptoms, because it's almost like they're seeing a distorted view of reality. They're hallucinating, they're delusional. Right? Like when they look at their own body, they don't see skin and bones. They see beauty. Except for those little ounces of fat that they might have throughout their body. Those ounces of fat are hideous to them. So what they see when they look in the mirror is completely different from what other people see. And that's, that's why I say it seems to have some issues with uh, psychosis in there. And the sad truth about anorexia is it is very difficult to treat. And due to the health complications that result, about 15% of these adolescents do die. Bulimia nervosa has the same kind of consequences, but it looks quite different from the outside. Because now the person is often eating excessively. You know, there, there's a lot of eating uh, in large amounts. This like binging. But the binging is always going to be followed by some form of purge. This could be through the taking of laxatives, this could be through self-induced vomiting, but the whole idea here is these bulimics, they love to eat, but they don't want it to affect them. They don't want the consequences of eating, so they will get rid of that food as quickly as they can. In fact, a lot of bulimics will report that they just can't stop eating, like they're always thinking about food. And that should make sense because they're starving. Even though they eat all the time, they're still starving because they never keep the food in their body. <clears throat> but besides these kinds of nutritional issues, there are some other health issues to consider during the teenage years. Like just in general, from the research we've done, it seems that uh, a good rule of thumb is to get about 30 minutes of exercise at least three times a week. So just go out and do some jogging or play some sports for at least 30 minutes three times a week. <clears throat> now, a lot of boys do engage in 
this amount of activity through sports. Boys do get involved in organized sports to a much greater extent than girls typically. And this isn't just good for their physical health. It actually also seems to enhance their social skills and their self-esteem and their critical thinking skills. Because when they're a part of a team, they have to use all those different parts of the personality and their cognitive skills in order to be successful. But while sports performance has a lot of benefits like these, it also has some downsides. <clears throat> uh, injuries in like teenage organized sports like high school teams and such, injuries are unfortunately somewhat common. About 15% of high school athletes are injured. And a small portion, uh, I don't have the exact number, but a small portion of these teams will also engage in illegal drug use to enhance their performance when participating, like to develop their muscles, to just uh, recover from injury, to, you know, accelerate their energy. There's a lot of different kinds of drugs that teams can use when it comes to enhancing their skills, but steroids is one of the more common ones. <clears throat> but just to wrap up this discussion of uh, health and well-being of a teenager, I wanted to mention that while teenagers do have certain things to worry about, typically teenagers are in pretty good shape. You know, they don't have too many health concerns to worry about. So when a teenager it does unfortunately die, that's that's pretty rare. You know, only about 0.1% of adolescents in the United States die each year. That might seem like a really low number, and it is a really low number, but that number should be actually a lot lower. Most of these deaths are preventable. Most of these deaths are not due to natural causes. So when we look at the cause of death for teens, we see some interesting data. African American boys die most often from firearms, while other boys die more often from motor vehicle accidents. So that statistic right there, that finding right there, is already pretty alarming. It, it should raise some pretty big red flags and start making you ask a lot of questions, like why do we see this split? I don't have the answer for you for, in this video, but the data is quite clear that there is a huge split between African boys and non-African uh, American boys. Girls, on the other hand, they die mostly due to either natural causes or motor vehicle accidents, but just like women of any age, females of any age, uh, the, co the rate of death is generally much lower. Women do tend to live longer than men. Now, in a previous video, I discussed how during these teenage years, there's a huge developmental difference between the limbic system and the frontal lobe. Remember, the limbic system has to do with desire and pleasure and emotional control and things like that, whereas the frontal lobe has more to do with critical thinking and planning ahead, you know, understanding cause and effect and stuff like that. So this huge developmental difference between the two does tend to result in teens being a bit more impulsive. And this is what we call the illusion of, results in what we call the illusion of invulnerability. This is a huge reason why we see a lot of these unfortunate and preventable deaths occur during the teenage years.